All right. God, thank you for this morning together uh, at part. And um, though the weather hasn't been quite as crazy as we thought, we're, we're grateful that um, we have the opportunity to encourage one another to sing, to hear your word and be shaped by your story that we find ourselves in even today. So we just pray, Lord, that you would uh, draw us near to you and may we find ourselves uh, closer to one another. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. So kids, come on close to the screen. I've got a story to share and I'm going to pull up a picture to help um, with the visual. What's on? Where? Hey, guys, guys, my kids are right here. They're going to be nice and loud. Where is my picture, guys? <laughs> there it is. Ah, all right. You see that picture? Kids, um, and you can unmute if you want, kids, because I want to interact with you a little bit. Can I Do you, if you see the picture, give me a thumbs up, kids. Yep. All right. Excellent. Of course I see it. All right. So, um, guys, have you? there's a French word I'm going to teach you this morning. I don't know if many of you know French. Graham knows French, but this word is called déjà vu. Can you say that as loud as you can in your house right now? Déjà vu. Déjà vu. Excellent. Excellent. So it just means that you're seeing something again. And believe it or not, the story that you're showing this morning, I told Augustine what I was doing. She's like, we did that last year and we did that like a couple of weeks ago. So it's right. There is this story that happens a couple of times and we're going to talk about why, but this is a feeding story. So if you guys put your listening ears on, Augustine, you're right next to the microphone. So everything you say is just super loud to them. So let me just, let me, let me take that real quick. All right. So um, I'm going to read this story. You guys look at that picture and paint the picture in your imagination. This is Jesus and Mark. And um, we, we've been following the disciples as they go across this lake and they've done some cool stuff. And then they're going to do something that you've seen before feeding a bunch of people. Spoilers. So here we go. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have had nothing to eat. Anybody else here would get hungry after not eating for three days? Yep. So if I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have a long have come a long distance. His disciple answers, but where in this remote place can we can anyone get enough bread to feed them? Does anybody feel like this is familiar before? Right? Raise your hand. You've heard this before, right? Didn't we just cover this in Mark chapter, was it six? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was Mark chapter six. We just had a story very similar to this. And guess what? The disciples are still asking a question about where to get food. You'd think they'd say, hey, we've seen this before. We know what Jesus can do. Well, Jesus asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground when he had given, no, he'd taken the seven loaves and given thank, he broke them and gave uh, them to the disciples to set before the people. And they did so. You think the seven loaves are going to feed enough, everybody? Spoilers. They do. They had a few small fish as well. And he gave thanks to them uh, for them and also, and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About how many? 4,000 men and women were present. And having sent them away, he got them into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. Guys, this has happened just a minute ago, right? Didn't Jesus just feed? Does anybody remember how many times, how many he fed the first time? Yeah, what you got, August? 5,000. 5,000. And now he's feeding 4,000. So, guys, what do we learn about this story? Why do you think the disciples ask if, how they're going to feed them? Did anybody want to take a stab at it, kids? Mm -hmm. Why do you think they ask? What you got, August? Because there's a lot of people and it would be really hard to feed all of them. But didn't they just see Jesus do that with even more people? Yeah. Guys, I got to tell you something. Okay. Your parents repeat things a lot. Do you know why? Because repetition is important for learning, right? And Jesus is doing almost the exact same miracle that he did just a minute ago. And yet the disciples still apparently haven't learned the lesson. Guys, sometimes we need repetition to learn lessons. And Jesus is showing them again that he is trustworthy, that he will provide, that he will take what they have if they share it and make it enough. And it's the same lesson they learned on, I think, the other side of the lake or something. So <clears throat> guys, uh, just believe this, that just like, just like Jesus is showing them over and over again, you can count on him. You can count on Jesus um, and, and we can learn and grow together. And Jesus 
doesn't mind, it seems, repeating a lesson. Now, there, there's this text goes on to talk about how the, the number of loaves collected might symbolically mean some things, that he's really trying to reach the whole world. But, but to this point, guys, if you can imagine yourself being a disciple and asking the same question, how are, how are you going to do this again? Jesus shows that he is trustworthy over and over and over again. So guys, um, just keep that in mind that uh, Jesus shows us again and again that he's worth counting on. Um, so kids, uh, keep that in mind as you think about Jesus, as you worry about things that he's provided before, he'll provide again. Jesus is like that. He's consistent. So um, let's see. I want to invite you. We're going to do that blessing that we did a few weeks ago where I'm going to invite you to move. So I'm going to move my computer a little bit. Kids, I want you to stand up with me. We're going to do something fun. Hey, no one can see me. No one can see me. Don't worry. It's not It's not like prayer aerobics or anything like that, but you can see me. Okay. All right. No one can so see me. this is called the Shema, which is an ancient uh, blessing in, in, in Israelite society, but it's, it's kind of like a pledge of allegiance to God. So we're going to, we're going to act it out with our hands. So I'm going to do it twice. One, just like our theme here, deja vu, you're going to see it twice. Um, so here we go. So everybody to get your hands up. Here, O oh Israel, the Lord your God, point up, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. That was always hard for me. Got that one? All right, all right. And then uh, love, can you guys make the love symbol? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Make a heart. And all your soul. Oh, that was awesome. That's not where your soul's located. It's just a play on words called a pun. And all your strength. All right, you guys want to do that one more time? Because repetition is good. All right. So we're going to do that. And guys, after this, you guys are more than welcome to stick around and, and talk to, and listen to Mike and Graham talk about some things going on in church and the word of God. You can also, and uh, parents, it, it's up to your discretion. They're more than welcome to stay. Or if you're, if you do play around, just, you know, try to keep it to a dull roar is what I'm going to tell my kids. So, okay. All right, you guys ready? We're going to do that Shema one more time. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. All right, kids, you have a wonderful and um, not as snowy snow day as we thought kind of thing. Godspeed. <laughs> all right, Graham, it's all you, bud. I don't right. <clears throat> Thanks, Ethan. I'm still holding out hope for the snow. I think it's coming at some point later today, or we'll just get this sleety, rainy mess. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, I'm going to give us just a couple of updates in a few different directions this morning, as always before Mike teaches. But would you humor me for a second? I know you, like me, this week have probably seen the devastating news coming out of Turkey and Syria with just the massive earthquake there and significant loss of life. We think of that. We remember other parts of the world that are broken in different ways and suffering in different ways. And so the devotional that I use, Lecto 365, I like it, recommend it if you don't know it. Um, but they just took time out to kind of acknowledge all that is going on in Turkey and Syria. And they focused in on the words of Psalm 46. And I, I found them really helpful. And I want to read them for us this morning. Um, the sense of it is, is just being still before God and, and knowing that he is God. And that's what we're doing, gathering here together today and every day. Um, we, we sit in stillness before God. We pray together. We help where we can. There are people in our church family who are already participating in the efforts in Turkey and Syria. And that's an amazing thing. So we do all of those things. But at the center of that is being present with God and, and trusting him. So let me read the words of Psalm 46, and then I will jump into a couple of updates. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. The nations are in chaos and their kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders and the earth melts. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. Be still and know that I am God. He is God today. 
He has been God before, since the beginning of time. He will be God on into the future. And that is the place we want to remain today and every day. So I acknowledge that together with you this morning. Let me mention just a couple of things. Number one, the one and only Aaron Messer was going to share today as our very first Livingstones testimony. We've bumped that to next month to March uh, for the second Sunday of the month, uh, just to do that in, in the way that, that we want to. Aaron wasn't 100% sure that his internet would hold up uh, to be able to share over Zoom today. So we're going to bump that to next week, but look forward to that. I know I am. We're really excited to hear from Aaron. We're really excited to start up our Living Stones initiative and just hear more and more about how God is at work in the lives of our families, our individuals, our families, our, our church community. So Aaron, we're excited to hear you next month. So look out for that on March 12th. Also, uh, if you were around last week, you will know that we are attempting to put together a church distribution list and to update the information in that to make it as current as possible. So the QR code that is on your screen now, take advantage of that. If you have not yet filled out that really simple form to give us your name and simple contact information, we want to make sure that we have a thorough church distribution list for a, a few different reasons. Uh, top amongst those reasons are, are just a chance for Mike and I to be reaching out directly and just to connect on an individual level with different people in our church, talk about prayer requests and how we can support that kind of thing. So a lot of it is from the care perspective, but there's some other reasons that it's, or other ways that it's helpful as well. So scan that QR code. If you haven't had a chance to do that yet, we're going to flash it up on the screen every Sunday for the next few weeks or so until that document is in a pretty robust place. Uh, so take advantage of that. We look forward to connecting more. And the last thing I want to tell us about is a, a very exciting thing. So as you know, we're going to have our next table talk at the end of this month on the 26th. That was scheduled to be at the, what's it called, Ethan? The name's escaping me. At the American Legion building, is that right? Out in Blowing Rock doesn't matter what it's called because we're not going to meet there anymore. So I want you to take a note of this important change. It's still going to be on the 26th at the same time. We're still going to watch that unspoken documentary together, but we are going to host it at Cornerstone Summit Church, which is a corner or the church just down the road from us on the corner there as you turn up towards the high school. We've been talking with Reggie Hunt there, who's the, the lead pastor at Cornerstone and some of the other staff, and they really want to partner with us, not just in this event, but in future events as well. I think there's a ton of potential within this. So the, the first simple step with that is that they've offered to host us for the viewing of this documentary on the 26th, which is awesome in terms of it being a more central location, but also just in terms of the, this growing partnership with Cornerstone. So look out for a lot more details on that, but make note specifically of the change of location for our next table talk. It won't be in Blowing Rock. It will be at Cornerstone Summit right in town here. So spread the word if uh, you know people who are wanting to participate in our table talk this month and we'll see where this goes. I, I think God's really opening up a way for us to do some cool things together in our community. These, these two church families and hopefully more than that as well, jumping in on the effort. So much more to come. All righty, Mike, I think that's all I have. So over to you, sir. Cool. Good morning, everybody. We are going to be in um, Acts chapter 27. We actually only have two more chapters, this this one and, and chapter 28. And uh, it's been quite a journey. And today, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not disappointed that there's not snow, um, but I, well, mostly because today's text is actually all about um, weather and, uh, and how it can, uh, shipwreck us sometimes. So um, I want to just tell the story and then I'll highlight a, a key section and a, a couple key verses. But but I want to show you something. Uh, let's share my screen here. Uh, we're going to look at the journey that Paul actually takes in this text. So he starts out way down here in Caesarea where he has been imprisoned under house arrest for two years. And he finally appeals to Caesar and Agrippa agrees um, he could be let go, but he's appealed to Caesar, so send him. So they appoint uh, an imperial uh, centurion, the leader of a hundred men from Rome to escort Paul with his men and other prisoners from Caesarea 
all the way over to Rome. And I hope you can see my mouse here. Um, so they jump on a, on a boat here in Caesarea, they jump up to, they go up to Sidon, and that first day, uh, Julius actually um, takes care of Paul and is, is very generous to him and lets him um, go and spend time with his friends there so they can kind of tend to him and take care of him before he goes on this long journey to Rome because who knows how long he'll be there. After that, they depart, and, and it's, it's important to note that on this journey, Paul is accompanied by at least Luke, the person who's writing Acts, because, and we know that because he says we in this text. And then he's also accompanied by someone else we've encountered before, um, Aristarchus. And Aristarchus, if you will remember, is the guy from Thessalonica up here in Macedonia, you see it right there, who when, when the, the Jewish mob there wanted to, to hurt Paul, Paul escaped and they pulled Aristarchus out and beat him instead because they had to just take their rage out on someone. So that's that's who this is. So Aristarchus and Luke, at the very least, are accompanying Paul on this journey from Caesarea all the way to Rome. They make it up here to, to Mira in Lucia and they get to Mira and they switch ships because this is probably where the original ship was ending its voyage. And then they slowly and very treacherously make it very, very slowly all the way over here to this place called Fair Havens. And in the in the point in the text where we get to Fair Havens here on the island of Crete, um, we actually see that that it took them a long, painstaking time to get there. They were trying to get to Phoenix, which is a safe harbor. And they just can't make it because it's been so difficult. And in fact, they've been journeying so long that it's now entering into, um, you know, Paul actually, he, he says um, the feast or the fast is already over. And what that is indicating at the time of year is, is during the Day of Atonement, which happens for, it's a 25 hour period that happens somewhere between September 15th and October 15th. And so that means it's it's late fall um and it's uh the the weather is getting worse and worse and it's just kind of known that you have a higher chance of of risk of encountering treacherous seas tempestuous winds um high waves danger so paul actually here in fair havens is saying like we need to stay here this is not safe um in order to to prevent loss of life um and cargo and the ship, we need to just stay here for the winter. Julius, the centurion, is like, I'm going to trust the professional. So he trusts the captain and the owner of the boat instead of Paul, and they leave. And their first day on the voyage, it's like, yeah, nice, smooth breeze. And they're like, see, Paul? And then that night, the winds just take over to the point that they can't see where they're going. They have no idea where they're going. They're just trying to stay afloat. And they end up being tossed around this little island, Kata. I can zoom in here. They get tossed around this island. And then they're just lost at sea for 14 days. 14 days just trying to, to stay alive. There's 276 people on this ship. And they're just trying to stay alive. And they finally, finally subside somewhere over here near Malta. And they start taking uh, the depths to see how close to, to shore they are. Um, and Paul is telling them, look, we've been under treacherous, stressful, horrendous conditions for 14 days. You need to eat. You need to eat. And before long, they decide, yeah, Paul's right, let's eat. And so in, in the midst of, of all this treachery, of all this turmoil, the, the, the word from Paul is, eat something. <laughs> eat something. And he also says, I had a dream last night. And God told me, like, basically, I have to, I have to go and speak before Caesar. And because of that, none of you are going to die. We're going to lose our ship, but none of you are going to die. And, and, and it's almost like, okay, 
we can breathe. So they sit down and they eat. And when they've had their fill, they end up throwing off all the excess. They start cutting anchors. They, um, they're, they're, they're close enough to shore that, um, the crew is, is telling everybody on the ship, the, the Roman guards, the prisoners, um, they're telling everyone, we're going to get in the boat so that we can go and, um, set more anchors so that we can kind of sit here and and weather the rest of this but really they're actually planning on just abandoning ship without <laughs> the the prisoners and the romans and so paul says hey if you let those guys um leave we're doomed and so the roman guards actually cut the ropes of those boats not allowing the um the the sailors the crew to get on those boats and and strand them so they're way out here in the sea they've They've anchored enough to just kind of be able to weather the rest of this. And then they realize they, they eventually see Malta in the distance. And they decide they're going to make straight for Malta and just run the ship aground on the beach. So they start heading towards Malta. They're, they've cut their anchors. They've cut their boats. They've gotten rid of all almost all their cargo. And before they reach the beach, they actually run aground on a coral reef and the the front of the ship starts actually tearing apart and and the roman soldiers who are afraid that the prisoners are going to escape by jumping in the sea and and, and running away decide they're going to kill all the prisoners paul would be included in that and it is a centurion who's who wants paul to live and says no everyone who can swim swim to shore and then everyone who can't swim, grab a piece of the boat and use it to get yourself to shore. So that's that's this this treacherous journey all the way to being shipwrecked on this remote island called Malta, south of Italy, in the Mediterranean Sea. And Paul says, um, you know, when, when he tells them to eat, um, I, I started thinking like, what is it like when when we have shipwrecks in our life like what is what is kind of the first thing to go and and oftentimes that is taking care of ourselves and i don't think it's a stretch to just say when when your life is being shipwrecked even if you told people how it should go and then they choose not to listen to you and you find yourself in a shipwreck and you have a told yourself moment at the end of the day you still got to eat you still got to take care of yourself and so that's what paul does he coaches them and he also affirms that they're not going to die they may lose stuff but they're not going to die it's okay so what i want to read is really this last section of chapter 27 to kind of close out today and and really focus on the last verse and then just kind of connect the thread of of god's providence in all of this so starting in verse 39 now when it was day and actually i'm going to stop sharing here when it was day um they did not recognize the land but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they had planned if possible to run the ship ashore so they cast off anchors and left them in the sea and at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders then hoisting the foresail to the wind they made for the beach but striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow struck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, that's Julius, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And here's the, here's the key verse here. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. And I want to highlight that verse because what Paul had encouraged them when he was encouraging them to eat was God is going to save us. He's not going to save our stuff, but he's going to save us. And even, even though there was imminent threat of death from the sink shipping, the, the, wow, the ship sinking, even though there was imminent threat of death from the soldiers who didn't want their own lives to be taken because prisoners had escaped, even though there was imminent threat of death from starvation, imminent threat of death from the elements, 
they were all brought safely to land because God wanted one person to make it to Rome. And I think that's really important because sometimes in the shipwreck of our lives, we forget that maybe God wants to accomplish something through someone else and we're experiencing this terrible thing, but we're alive. We're alive. Earlier this week, I was in a, in a faith-driven entrepreneur meeting, which is one of my favorite things to do. And we were talking about how we always think of blessing as scale. We always think of blessing as getting more of, of, of accumulation of stuff. But truly, blessing is the breath you get every morning when you wake up. The fact that you wake up, that you have life, is a really, really significant blessing. And even when things shipwreck our lives, even if it's because of somebody else, even if it's because of your own choices, you can rejoice Maybe not in the hardship, maybe not in the difficulty, but you can rejoice that God has given you breath. That is a blessing. And so in the shipwreck of our lives, when that happens, it's okay to breathe and accept that you're alive and that is enough. It's okay. That's my message for today. I believe Jasmine's going to close this out. Hey, thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, we're just going to conclude with the benediction today. Um, yeah, it was very nice to get to see everybody. Um, and not any snow. Good to see you too.